Welcome everybody. I see some new names, I think. Good to see you all. Welcome if you're new. Welcome if you're not new. Greetings and blessings. Good, good smiles around. Okay. Everybody can hear me okay? Just nod your head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was starting to wonder. Good. Okay, so today, tonight I should say, we will begin with our usual guided loving kindness or boundless love meditation. And I will be reading a short sutta uh, throughout. And after this short half hour meditation, I will be giving a talk on the Gaviopama Sutta, that is this, the analogy of the cow. And we'll see how the Buddha compares uh, this cow that wants to roam around treacherous mountain grounds without being prepared and compares it to the jhana practice. So tonight's talk will be about navigating the jhanas, which, with whichever vehicle or subject of development that we choose. The jhanas remain the same, whether we use the metta, the karuna, the mudita, upekka, either one of the satipatthanas. And so it is always a, a very good thing to know how to navigate them. And that sutta is particularly good at describing it. But before this, I invite you to take a very comfortable position Perhaps having your back straight will help you. But the important part here is to feel at ease, feel comfortable yourself. Be good to yourself here and now. We need to be able to be at ease and comfortable to practice metta properly. Because we first need to feel it within ourselves. That is the whole purpose. And so being comfortable will help tremendously. Perhaps laying down on the couch is not the most energetic position. You might fall asleep. so having your back somewhat straight, even if it's leaning against something. And again, pain is very optional in this kind of meditation. Begin by feeling at ease and relaxing any tension there might be in your body. And sometimes it can help to take a deep breath Let all of your thoughts of the day wash away and smile.
your mind might be asking questions right now it might be moving here and there throbbing just let go have faith trust it will calm down and you will understand only by smiling and relaxing and feel the happiness the joy of your smile coursing through your whole body like the Buddha said a joyful mind helps to relax the body and having a calm body free of tensions is uplifting for the mind it is easy for the mind to be joyful therefore joy and relaxing or letting go come together hands in hands And together they form the first factor of the first jhana. We wake ka jang piti sukkang, the blissful happiness that comes from letting go. Whenever we are calming down the tensions in the body and moving away, letting go from mental distractions, whether it's this or that, it doesn't matter the subject, the topic of the hindrance. As we move away from it and experience this Viveka jang piti sukkang, blissful happiness that comes from this gradual letting go. There is the practice of the first level of meditation.
you feel like you've calmed down and that the mind is a little more docile and a little bit more uplifted you can bring up the feeling of love inside your heart again coursing through your whole body not forcing it to be a particular way allowing it to open to spread that warm radiant perhaps stingly feeling that you feel starting from the center of your chest and running along through your whole body and if you can allow it to simply be fully radiant all around above and below not forcing but allowing relaxing with a smile Remember your love for all living beings everywhere. without a trace of anger or resentment or impatience just love unbounded
remember this one truth. Is that everybody wants to be loved. in the best of ways, unconditionally, second chance after second chance. Never slackening Seeing boundless love as our own strength. Our protection. This very genuine and heartfelt feeling of care, of goodwill, of attention, tenderness. and most sincere best wishes for all living beings happiness
And as the Buddha said, monks, whatever vehicle or ground there is for producing goodness and for the generation of karma, All of these are not worth one sixteenth of the liberation of the mind through boundless love. Radiant, blazing and shining forth. The liberation of the mind through boundless love surpasses them. Monks, just like whatever radiance there is from the stars, all of it is not worth one-sixteenth of the moon's radiance. Radiant, blazing and shining forth, the moon's radiance surpasses them all. In the same way, whatever vehicle or ground there is for producing goodness, all of these are not worth one sixteenth of the liberation of the mind through boundless love. Radiant, blazing and shining forth, the liberation of the mind through boundless love surpasses them all. Monks, just last in, just like in the last month of the monsoon season, in the autumn, when the sky is clear and the rain clouds have passed, the sun rises above the dark mass, radiant, blazing and shining forth winning over all of space, winning over darkness and driving it away. In the same way, whatever vehicle or ground there is for producing goodness and generating new karma, all of these are not worth one sixteenth of the liberation of the mind through boundless love. Radiant, blazing and shining forth, the liberation of the mind through boundless love surpasses them all. Monks, just like at the end of the night, the morning star radiates, blazes and shines forth. In the same way, whatever vehicle or ground there is for producing goodness and for generating new karma, all of these are not worth one sixteenth of the liberation of the mind through boundless love. Radiant, blazing, shining forth, the liberation of the mind through boundless love surpasses them. For one who develops the feeling of love with boundless presence, the fetters wear away and seen as the ending of karma. Having an unspoiled mind towards one being lovingly there is goodness therein. But having a compassionate mind towards all beings, the Arya generates an abundance of merit.
even when having conquered this earth filled with the living. The virtuous king sets out performing offerings, horse offerings, men offerings, food offering, money offering, unobstructedly. Still, he does not partake in one sixteenth of a mind well developed in boundless love. Like the moon's radiance is to the stars, one who does not kill nor causes to kill, who does not conquer nor causes to conquer, with a heart of love towards all living beings, in such a person, anger cannot be found. And as the mind receives this impression from the Buddha's words and wisdom, The Buddha's praise of loving kindness and boundless love meditation. A meditation which is very often overlooked. And we can remember that the beauty of metta, metta bhavana, cultivating a boundless loving heart, the way the Buddha explained it, is hard to go wrong. And there is a lot to learn from it. And this will strengthen our own practice in so many ways. Strengthen our natural capacity for awareness.
and practicing this loving kindness and having the instructions on how to bring up the feeling, how to allow it to be fully open in all directions. These are the meditation instructions to start with. And it, they are the same for the compassion, the joy, and the calm or equanimity. Or whether someone might be practicing the four satipatthanas, the resting places of awareness. Via the breath or not, depending. There are stages of meditation that one goes through. And the Buddha did not teach all kinds, that all kinds of meditations led to what he awoke to. There's a specific, there's a certain path we need to understand. And the beginning instructions are the beginning instructions how to practice bring up bringing up the feeling of love at the beginning we can use we can direct our mind as the buddha said we can direct it to an uplifting object we can remember someone uh, whether it's a friend someone that we love someone that we respect or a child or animals or some people is nature they feel a strong connection with all living beings strong love very wholesome feeling for all of life and then once the feeling is generated and is strong enough to be more settled then we can simply without directing our thoughts without thinking about a specific object in particular but simply resting the mind on the radiance of the feeling simply allowing it to continually bloom and as I will be reading the sutta, I will be comparing it, I will be using the metta meditation to, to draw parallels with our practice as we deepen the practice into these levels of meditations that were called the jhanas. And here is the analogy of the cow. And this is a very wonderful sutta uh, because it tells us really how this process of going through the jhanas works by letting go and enjoying each of the stages of meditation, not trying to rush through them, but to relax and calm down and settle into them. And this is how we go through with insight, because each of these jhanas or levels of meditations they are insights themselves into the nature of the mind the buddha's that is the buddha's roadmap how we explained what the mind will do as it lets go of all of its distractions and impurities and so he says, just as if a mountain cow who was careless, inexperienced, not well versed in pastures, and unskilled what was roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds, she would think, perhaps I could go somewhere I have never been before, eat some grass I have never eaten, and drink some water I have never drunk. Then, without having firmly set down her front hoofs first, she would begin lifting her rear hoofs 
In this way, she would never make it, where she has never gone before, let alone eat grass she has never eaten, and drink water she has never drunk. And even if she eventually made it there, she could never make it back safely to where she came from. Why is that? Because she is a careless, inexperienced, not well-versed in pasture, an unskilled mountain cow roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. Similarly, monks, a meditator who is careless, inexperienced, not well-versed in the pastures and unskilled, and this is why I am reading this sutta, because it, it is good to be skilled in the pastures. And these jhanas, they are the pastures of the mind. And so here we need to understand these pastures so that we can navigate them and move through them skillfully. That meditator might want to practice disengaged from outward desires and detached from unwholesome mental states, still attended with thinking and reflection. This is bringing up an object there. There is still this active thinking, but it's completely wholesome at this point. It's a very loving, wholesome, uplifting recollection. With the blissful happiness born of letting go, and might try to understand and abide in the first level of meditation. But that meditator does not indulge in nor enjoy the characteristics of this state. That meditator does not develop them, does not practice them frequently, does not settle into them until they become stable. Then that meditator would think, perhaps I could with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, my mind becoming unified without thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness, understand and abide in the second level of meditation. But that meditator would not be able to enter the second jhana. Then that meditator would think, perhaps I could disengage from outward desires and detach from unwholesome mental state. Now, not having taken the time to really settle in the first jhana has this restless mind that comes up and wants to go further, but the mind, this is not how it works. We cannot force the mind to go into jhana. In fact, we have to let go and cultivate the mind properly. And so having even been able to get to the second jhana because of excitement or putting too much effort, not being patient enough, then trying to come back to the first jhana, but the first jhana is not well understood either. Still attended by thinking and reflection with the blissful happiness born of letting go. Understand and abide in the first level of meditation. But that meditator would not be able to enter the first jhana. So here, the, like the mountain cow, would not be able to come back to where it came from. Monks, this is called a meditator who has gotten lost in both respects, who has fallen, fallen away in both regards. Just as the careless, inexperienced, not well-versed in, in pastures and unskilled mountain cow roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. And this, these are very... Uh, this is very common. This is very common when we want to, we have good experiences and we kind of try to see if we can get there just by, you know, doing it. But that's not how it works. We have to let go and understand these levels. And they're not particularly hard. We just have to understand. That's all. 
Suppose there was a wise, experienced, well-versed in pastures and skilled mountain cow roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. She would think, perhaps I could go somewhere I have never been before, eat some grass I have never eaten before, and drink some water I have never drunk before. Then, having firmly set down her front hoofs first, she would begin lifting her rear hoofs. In this way, she would make it where she has never gone before, eat grass she has never eaten before, and drink water she has never drunk before. And she eventually would make it there. She would make it back safely to where she came from. Why is that? Because she is a wise, experienced, well-versed and pastured and skilled mountain cow, roaming about treacherous high mountain grounds. In the same way, monks, there might be a meditator who is wise, experienced and well-versed in pastures and skilled in being disengaged from outward desires, all distractions, and detached from unwholesome mental states, impatience, anger, still attended by thinking and reflection, with the blissful happiness born of letting go, and would understand and abide in the first level of meditation, that meditator would indulge and enjoy the characteristics of this state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. Then one thinks, then one would think, perhaps I could, with the calming of thinking and reflection, with inner tranquilization, my mind becoming unified without thinking or reflection with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness, understand and abide in the second level of meditation. And without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the second jhana, but rather by the calming of thinking and reflection, by inner tranquilization, by that meditator's mind becoming unified without thinking nor reflection with the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. One understands and abides in the second level of meditation. And so at the beginning we had these, these possible thoughts, these very wholesome thoughts. And then wh whichever thoughts they were, it doesn't matter, they uplift the mind and they help us bring out that feeling. Once that feeling settles, that metta, then it becomes more established. It's like easier to kindle, easier to maintain. And we will notice naturally that, these, that this active thinking, bringing up an object, becomes too heavy for the mind. And we can simply carry on the vehicle of loving-kindness without actively thinking about an object. And this is what is meant here. And the first piti sukha of the first jhana, the happiness, the joyful happiness that comes from letting go, from viveka, after doing this movement, viveka, and letting go, for a while and the mind settles into that state, we will start noticing that it collects. It starts to gather because it doesn't have this thinking anymore. And when the mind doesn't think, it just rests on its own here. And so it becomes collected. And that's what the Buddha called samadhi ja piti sukkang. So that is the blissful happiness born of mental collectedness. So at the beginning when we were relaxing, letting go of tensions and distractions, that felt good and the mind felt uplifted by that with the metta also. 
But now as the mind gets collected, there is, we notice there is great joy that happens because of this. Because the mind that is collected and rid of imperfections, there is nothing but happiness in the mind. There is no hindrance. That is why they are called hindrance to happiness. That meditator would indulge and enjoy the, in the characteristics of this state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. Then one would think, perhaps I could, with the calming of stronger joy, abiding in mental steadiness, present and fully aware, experiencing happiness within my body, that state which the righteous ones describe as such, steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. One would understand and abide in the third level of meditation. And without forcing nor pushing the mind to enter the third jhana, but rather by the calming of that stronger joy and that abiding in that mental steadiness, that present, uh, presence and full awareness, experiencing happiness within one's own body, that state which the awakened ones describe as such steady presence of mind, this is a pleasant abiding. One understands and abides in the third level of meditation. And here what happens is that as the mind gets collected, and see here we see all of the seven awakening factors lining up through the jhanas. The beginning was awareness, sati, and then there was dhamma vichaya, our own meditation, bringing up the metta, letting go of the tension. That's what it means here. And virya, then after, is doing this with devotion, doing this constantly, continuously. It's not forcing, it's being devoted to it, devoted to wholesome states. And then from this great joy arises, the fourth awakening factor. From that joy there is samadhi, that collectedness of mind. And here in the third jhana it introduces the sixth or the seventh awakening factor is steadiness of mind, upeka. I miss tranquility, but <laughs> it is here, and it is in that um, very much in these uh, when the Buddha says experiencing happiness within one's body, that's what it means is that tranquility, that tranquil ease in the body and the calming of stronger joy. So here the PT it gets more refined. It's not as strong but it's much more steady and much more easy to maintain in fact. That meditator would indulge and enjoy the in the characteristics of the state develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. And at this point there is very strong steadiness of mind that starts to happen, that starts to stream, and that steadiness feeds the first factor of awakening again, which is awareness. That steadiness of mind is ending and contributing, strengthening the first one, so that this whole chain is self-strengthening, self-supporting. Perhaps I could, unattached to blissful feelings and unstirred by unpleasant feelings, with the settling of excitement and disturbances, balanced and steady, purified by unmoving presence, understand and abide in the fourth level of meditation. Without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the fourth jhana, 
but rather by being unattached to blissful feelings, by being unstirred by unpleasant feelings, with the earlier settling of excitement and disturbances, by being balanced in regards to all sensations and purified by unmoving presence. One understands and abides in the fourth level of meditation. And see here that th this is something that is happening a lot in many practices is we try to force the equanimity of that fourth jhana that is spoken of here. But it is not an upeka, a steadiness of mind that can be forced. It is one that is developed through joy and letting go. And this is not the kind of equanimity that I tell you to sit, for example, through a lot of pain and you have to remain equanimous with it. That's not what we're talking about here. This is about purposefully uplifting the mind with joy, letting go of the distractions, relaxing them, and having this uplifted mind that goes into that the Buddha's Samadhi and that Samadhi which blooms into steadiness of mind. And this is when we understand that this steadiness of mind, not so much equanimity, it is equanimity, of course, it is another way we can call it, but steadiness of mind is much closer. It's this streaming awareness because the mind is very happy, it's very uplifted. So it is aware by nature. We don't need to do much about it. That's what we're training ourselves to do this whole time, in fact. And we get to understand at this point, it becomes very steady and very settled. And the metta is, at this point, the metta is very subtle. Because at this point, the mind is very liberated. It is very open. So any kind of bringing up anything is uh, would be heavying down the mind. And so the metta is still there, but it is very, very easy to kindle and very light. And it is very... Uh, broad. <laughs> that meditator would indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of this state, develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. And as we've learned in the past in the other talks, now this is the, this is the limit of metta but not the limit of the other Brahma Viharas. If we wish to continue with the Brahma Viharas, we can hear the, the feeling will change a little bit. It, it will become a little bit more distant, and we call that karuna, compassion. And this is more of a detached, but still very, very wholesome uh, feeling. Then one would think, perhaps I could, passing beyond all perception of form, this is body. At this point, body awareness will start to fade away. Body awareness at this point is a little coarse for the mind. And to experience the next levels of meditation, this body awareness is not really... Uh, we, it's not that it disappears, it will stay there, but the mind stops being aware of it. It stops paying attention to it. Therefore, it is liberating itself from form, rupa. And thus we enter the arupa jhanas, the formless jhanas. Having gone beyond all perception of form, with the awareness of the senses fading behind, unattentive to plurality. This means simply there is at this point very good collectedness of mind. 
it becomes very obvious at this point. Aware of endless spaciousness, one would understand and abide in the plane of endless spaciousness. Without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of endless spaciousness, but rather by going beyond all perception of form, by the fading away of sensory awareness, by not paying attention to plurality, but only to be aware of that collectedness, aware of endless spaciousness, one understands and abides in the plane of endless spaciousness. In another sutta, the Buddha says, this plane of endless spaciousness happens because of its opposite, which is rupa. And when we leave the rupa behind the body, or we, it's not like it completely, uh, if we decide to feel it or look at it, it will be there. If a, a mosquito lands on you or something, the wind blows, you'll feel it. But the mind isn't interested anymore. It's in such strong piti and collectedness that... And strong, uh, by all means, I don't mean uh, big fireworks, Hollywood, strong joy, but I mean uh, very delightful, blissful happiness. And this will be very clear. And these states are not reserved for any special elite or monks. These states are very experienceable by anybody. Of course, we, it is hard to experience this in half an hour of meditation. Usually it will be a little bit more, like on a retreat. Uh, this state in particular may be uh, day three, day four on the retreat when we meditate about five, six hours a day, seven. But it's not impossible at all. And uh, anybody can experience this uh, when they know how to practice properly. That meditator would indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of this state develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. See here how it works, same pattern, every jhana. Then one thinks, perhaps I could, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless spaciousness, aware of endless consciousness, understand and abide in the plane of endless consciousness. And so here again, like we saw in another discourse, this is the spaciousness is the limit of karuna, compassion. And if we want to continue with the Brahma Viharas, the karuna, even karuna becomes too coarse at this, at this point. And only mudita or simply joy, which is very, very light, it is very light, but it is very, uh, very wholesome. And at this point, there is, the insight is that we, having left this sensation of moving out of the body into the mind, which is this sense of spaciousness that occurs. And when we get stronger or more settled into that spaciousness, even that spaciousness fades away. And what, what the mind moves towards then is as it becomes more refined, consciousness starts to break up. And we get to see that consciousness is not actually a one stream. It is actually many, 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 many little pieces of consciousness and at this point it starts to break up and we see that this consciousness is happening 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 there is always this knowing of something therefore that is what consciousness means it means consciousness 
con means with shisness is from sire and this is to know and we know of something and at this point we are very aware that this steady knowing of things this or that there is always these things in the mind that are happening and that we're actually not really doing it but mostly it is happening on its own without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of endless consciousness but rather by going beyond the plane of endless space aware of endless consciousness one understands and abides in the plane of endless consciousness and this is, would be with radiant joy very subtle at this point it starts to become very subtle we're witnessing very deep insights on the nature of the mind here and this is quite wonderful that meditator would indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of this state develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. Then one would think, perhaps I could, having gone entirely beyond the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular, understand and abide in the plane of bare awareness or the plane of nothingness without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane of bare awareness, but rather by the going beyond of the plane of endless consciousness, aware of nothing in particular. One, in, one understands and abides in the plane of bare awareness. And this bare awareness is simply that now that we have grown wisdom, See, these stages, they all happen because of the Four Noble Truths, the Four Awakened Understandings. They are awakened understandings because as we understand them th through each of these levels of meditation, they are leading us to awakening and liberating the mind. And that is to see each of these states, each of these levels, as we are practicing them to see that there is in each one of them as we settle into them and we practice them often to see what creates tension in the mind as we move on and so that we can release that and release the mind even further and these are the Four Noble Truths but very briefly explained that is the truth that we see there is tension. We see that there is something that is heavying down the mind. And how can we move away from that? How can we let that go and experience greater happiness? What is the cessation of suffering? What could that be if not happiness? <laughs> so we are experiencing greater and greater stages of mind release because we are sharpening our wisdom of the Four Noble Truths through each of these levels. And this endless consciousness, what happened is that we saw that all this mental activity going on all the time, even though we have joy, radiant joy, it is slightly heavy and we kind of want to move away from that. We want to let that go. We would like to experience a greater release from that, where there is not so much that train of consciousness, if I can say. And there we are led to bare awareness, or the space of nothingness, where there is awareness, but it is uncoupled. It is simply aware, aware of itself, or aware of awareness, aware of being aware. And that is simply, I call it bare awareness because it has this disinterested kind of awareness, which is more blissful than any of the previous stages. 
that meditator indulges and enjoys the characteristics of the states, develops them, practices them frequently, and settles into them until they become stable. Then one thinks, perhaps I could, going, having gone entirely beyond the plane of bare awareness, understand and abide in the, in the plane between awareness and its release, without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the plane between awareness and its release but rather by the going beyond of the plane of bare awareness one understands and abides in the plane be between awareness and its release now this is the plane where we this is also called neither perception or non-perception and this is where we sharpen our wisdom or discernment we see that even that awareness comes with a little tiny, tiny, tiny bit of tension. <laughs> and it's very subtle. But as we settle into that state and we don't try to go, we don't try to push into cessation, we don't try to go into Nibbana, but we understand that we really get to relax, lean back into that state and understand it with wisdom. We see, oh, there is slight tension in this awareness even. What if I were to move away from that, release that even awareness? And that's why we call this space neither perception or non-perception because that is where awareness itself starts to dissolve and this is the great magnificence of the Buddha's teaching is the complete release from even awareness and this is quite profound that meditator would indulge and enjoy in the characteristics of this state develop them, practice them frequently, and settle into them until they become stable. Now at this point, even in the plane of bare awareness, there was this equanimity that was still possible to radiate. But beyond this, it is impossible to bring the Brahma Viharas. And now at this point, there is only awareness of mind as mind. Basically, we are taking the satipatthanas at one of the highest or the most purified level of mind that we can practice. And we take only this mind because as, as vehicle for awareness. Because to generate any kind of feeling, even though it is very wholesome, even though it is very subtle equanimity, radiant equanimity, just this movement is heavying down the mind. So we need to let that go. And at this place, we take mind, clear mind, as our object, or simply the thing that will carry us forward. And in this state of where the limit of awareness, and as the name entails it, we will start, there will be sections where it is a bit like falling asleep but being aware at the same time because that is what it feels like to l release awareness completely. But we, this is a very fine line where a little too much energy will bring up a coarser awareness, bring up more uh, tension in awareness, more too much energy. And then not enough might 
there might be some drowsy, drowsiness <laughs> occurring. So we need to simply we 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 are balancing. We are learning to balance our faculties and balance the awakening factors, where there is enough awareness to to continue our practice and to let go continually it's like polishing a, a mirror or a window so much that it's like it's disappearing at some point it is so clear that it disappears and this is a, a process it takes a little bit of time this is really sharpening at the very end uh, our our discernment and we will learn to what is the direction in there what is how to release and how to uh, not over analyze and to actually release and continue our work with the seven uh, the four noble truths then one thinks perhaps i could go going entirely beyond the plane between awareness and its limit. Understand and abide in the release from perceptual awareness, niroda, and that is also nibbana, without forcing or pushing the mind to enter the release from perceptual awareness, but rather by the going beyond of the plane of of the plane between awareness and its limit. One understands and abides in the release from perceptual awareness. And at some point as we do this and as we train ourselves to understand and settle our mind in that very subtle state where there is this kind of letting go of awareness, we are learning to release awareness completely. And this is uh, where the Buddha says, Sabba Sankara Sammato, with the complete calming of all mental activity. There is complete release. And as we get more established in that space and we understand with discernment the movement, where to go, <laughs> we, there will be a time when it is not through pushing the mind into that state it is not by thinking oh I will enter cessation but rather it is by letting go completely and even letting go of the path letting go of entering cessation letting go of Nibbana letting go of any kind of concept any kind of awareness any kind of anything just completely letting it go and as we become stronger in this steadier then there will be a time where the mind there is a, the lights go out there is a moment in time where there is no more awareness there is and this is called Niroda. And this is the end of the Buddha's teaching. At the beginning, this might not last for very long. This will last maybe a fraction of a second, or it will be gradual also. The more we practice at that level, the more likely a meditator is to be able to remain in there longer. But this is uh, the deepest rest that the mind has ever had. Even sleeping isn't even close to that. Even anything that we can do in this world is, cannot compare to the bliss of release at that level. And when the mind comes out of this state the 
the only way a person can be aware that this state actually happened is by retrospectively when a person when awareness starts again when the first sankharas when the first mental fabrications that are conditioned in our mind arise again and mindfulness starts to look at that again <laughs> then we are aware then a person is aware that oh there was a time where there was nothing because a person cannot be aware while they're not aware in that state so <laughs> a person is only aware of that state when they come out and the bliss of release of that state is quite wonderful quite uh, quite uplifting and quite freeing and the Buddha's teaching can be truly understood at that level and how magnificent the Buddha's teaching was is truly understood at this level where uh, the mind is completely undirected and void <laughs> and this this kind of mind has nothing but happiness in it and where whatever it does wherever it stands it walks whatever it touches it is simply a very very happy experience or released therefore monks because that meditator experiences these stages of meditation and is mentally elevated by them, one's mind becomes pliant and wieldy. With such a compliant and wieldy mind, one is well trained in measureless samadhi, apamana samadhi. One well-trained in measureless samadhi can direct and incline one's mind to whatever state knowable by direct experience. And one is able to witness with one's own eyes anything in that base. And here the Buddha goes on about the psychic abilities which I will not read to you tonight because it's as long as what I just read, and I think this is enough. But uh, this was the core of this sutta, and I think uh, this is by far the most important part. And I hope that uh, it helped you understand these levels of meditation and how to navigate through them by letting go and joy and always, always looking for that joy of release and moving away from the tension. That is always the direction. And this, is, this will ensure us that we practice properly and avoid some pitfalls that are easily avoidable when we just know about them. And so on this I will I will leave some time for questions if there are any and then after we will share merits and all these things. Maybe everybody became awakened. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> good. Yes. Yes. Uh, has it, Buddha ever uh, taught about spiritual friend, starting metta with a spiritual friend? Because in the most of the suttas, he starts with uh, 
uh, one direction at a time and then all the directions but is there any sutta where he talks about spiritual friend also no not really this um this is from a book that is called the Visuddhi Magga. It is a commentarial, uh, uh, exegetical work that is uh, beside the canon that was written by a venerable Buddha Gosa. And um, that is where this, uh, this practice of a uh, spiritual friend can, can be found. In great details, um, it is not found in the suttas, and but that doesn't mean that um, it is not found as it is like this, uh, like it can be taught by some some practices uh, in the suttas. But it the Buddha this falls into the category of vitaka vichara, which is bringing up a wholesome object. So whatever a spiritual friend, it, whatever it is, if it is a spiritual friend, if it is something that is uplifting your mind, the Buddha, in fact, said that recollecting the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha were very uh, uplifting for those who possess that faith, possess that understanding in the teaching. It is very easy to uplift the mind. Recollecting generosity, virtue of oneself, and the devas even. Uh, and the spiritual friend, uh, mainly it is described in the Visuddhi Magga, not in the suttas, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. Simply, um, uh, it is one aspect of what the Buddha called directed meditation. So it is in line with the Buddha's teaching and uh, in the right efforts. So your question is about right effort? So the using spiritual friend is in line with Buddha's teaching and right efforts, I said. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yes. Bhante, may I ask a question? Yes. Okay. When you give metta, when you do meditation and you give metta to the devas and to all sentient beings, do you give metta to Buddha himself? Um, and why not? <laughs> well, I would say that Buddha can be a very good uh, recollection to bring this feeling. When we when we think of the Buddha, or when we bring to mind the Buddha and how many lifetimes did he spend as a bodhisattva just helping, helping others out of love, out of compassion, giving everything that he had, giving even his limbs and even his life in many, 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 many occasions, thousands of hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. This kind of dedication and devotion is very powerful for a person that that sees that and understands that and uh, has that capacity for being uplifted by it. And so, when we when we radiate the feeling of love, in fact. It's not necessarily that we send it to someone in particular, but it's more that we actually feel that for ourselves. And the, the thing is that the feeling it and the radiating it to all living beings, that is 
especially wholesome for our own mind. And so you could, uh, if you would like, if that works for you, uh, you could radiate to uh, the Buddha, if you like. Personally, I do not recommend uh, spending too much time on one thing. I, In fact, I really follow what the Buddha says in the suttas, and it has to be boundless, measureless, apamana, without limit, not just for one person, for everybody. And then it's very, very, very powerful, very wholesome. Yes, uh, I, I hear what you said. To, to the all direction, Sabe, Manusa, Sabe, Deva, and everything and everywhere. And also include the Buddha. Yes, sure. Why not? Is this, not, is this uncommon? Yes, why not? But it sounds like it's not common. How <laughs> is it? There are some teachings and teachers and lineages and ways of practices that say that you should not radiate loving kindness to a dead person because that won't work. Well, the devas? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. I don't I mean, if if you feel love, you feel love, you know, that's that's it. <laughs> And whether it's for I think, yes, thank you. I think after Parinibbana, uh, Buddha doesn't have to exist as a person. It's my understanding. Yes. So it's better to give metta to the coming Buddha, Arya Maitreya. Yes. This is my view. Actually, I don't know. Well, uh, if you know. For example, so many people have, and the Buddha actually says that. Uh, in fact, this is not. A, this is really. A, this is called Buddha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha. Uh, like there is Dhamma Nusati and then there's Sangha Nusati, recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And the Buddha said, "This is very, you know, powerful meditation in itself." And to recollect the Buddha, he said, recollect, recollect the good qualities, uh, and you can, you can, if you like, you can uh, picture Meteya in the uh, in the in the uh, Tawatimsa heaven or the Tusita heaven waiting for his time on earth to take his last birth and become a Buddha. Uh, or, but you can also recollect the Buddha. You, you can. And many, many people do this. And this is an actual meditation practice, which the Buddha, I gave talks on this, uh, taught to people to uplift their minds into samadhi. And... There's so many instances in the suttas where people would just walk up to the Buddha and, you know, the Buddha had the, the characteristics, all the characteristics of an excellent man, of like his, he was very, um, just to look upon the Buddha was very inspiring because of his demeanor, because of his, the way that he was deporting himself. And because he was known to be Vija Charana Sampanno, so he was known to be practicing what he taught. He he had the knowledge, but he had the conduct also. So he was perfect in both. And just to lay eyes upon the Buddha, many people, their their minds were just instantly uplifted and calm and confident in him because of just seeing him and so this is very this is this is a very tangible meditation that you can do is recollecting the buddha yes 
but uh, recollecting the qualities of buddha is one meditation and giving metta to buddha himself yes. is another i think yeah. yes well we can we can we can really divide these things or we can unify them and uh, personally i tend to unify them because i think recollecting the buddha and joy for the buddha i mean how far from having love for the buddha is that and the word pt actually is priti it's like priyang is love something that is endearing so it's not only joy it's not we we have started to translate these terms in english to in take that direction but really uh these terms they they are not so separate and i think that they are strengthening each other in fact yes thank you truan sarad sad sad mante can we have your email address <laughs> yes sure um Okay, how can we do this? <laughs> I in the chat box. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, there's many things happening here. Okay. Okay. I think Here you go. Good. I thought I saw Terry opening up his Yeah, the nada. Terry opening up his mic. Thank you, Bante. Yes. Thanks for the email. That was that was a mistake. Okay, good. No problem. <laughs> I don't like to get too verbal after your, your talks because I'm not in that headspace. It's just beautiful. I don't feel like talking. Very good. That's very good. <laughs> good. Okay. Let us share our merits. many many merits tonight wonderful practice dukkha patta jani dukkha bhaya patta jani bhaya sukha patta jani sukha hontu sabbe pipani no idang no punyam sabbe satta numodantu sabba sampatti siddhiya आकसत्ता देवनागा पुण्यं May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief May all beings share these merits that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness may beings inhabiting space and earth devas and nagas of mighty powers share these merits of ours may they long protect the buddha sasana sadu 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 tarwan sarani bante thank you bante Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. All Thank blessings. You. Thank you. I hope all blessings are with you this week. And everything yeah. good. Have a good week. Take care. <laughs>